heat in a matter of seconds. The second are these thick ceramic walls, which uh, work great for holding in heat and moisture. We'll simply place the grill grate in the grill. Now put the trout on. And when you place the trout on the grill, go oil side down to start. Close the grill lid and adjust these vents so that you attain a grilling temperature of about 350 degrees. It's that simple to control the heat. Okay, don't forget to check on your fish and uh, it helps to have a big head spatula uh, to turn the fish. Let's take a look. And if one fish is cooking faster than the other, all you need to do is just uh, change positions. In general, the fish in the center cook a little bit more quickly than the fish on the outside. And you can see these are not sticking at all. Here's a lemon dill mustard sauce that goes great with any grilled fish, especially trout. It starts with mayonnaise, sour cream, mustard, and I like uh, Dijon mustard for this, but you could also use a honey mustard if you want a touch of sweetness, uh, lemon zest, chopped fresh dill, which reinforce the lemon dill flavor in the trout, and finally, fresh lemon juice. Simply whisk the ingredients together. You can see I'm working over ice. Always a good idea to keep any mayonnaise-based sauce over ice. And that's the sauce. I think the trout are ready. Wow, they look fantastic. So how do you know they're cooked? Well, first of all, they're golden brown. You press the trout and you can feel the meat sort of flake under your finger. And if you really want to make sure, you can make a little cut in the back of the trout and just check that the meat next to the bone is fully cooked. So let's take off the trout. And uh, I love to serve grilled fish on a banana leaf. We'll take this one off, and you can see we have absolutely no sticking. And of course, don't forget to remove the string. Secret number two for no stick fish, wrap it in prosciutto or bacon. Now let's see how we did here. Cut a little piece of fish and our mustard dill sauce. Mm. This is really delicious. What's nice is how the prosciutto flavors the trout. And it also it gets almost crackling crisp. So this actually crunches when you bite into it. Many years ago, when I first started traveling the world's barbecue trail, I went to the islands of Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. And shark and bake is a popular beach food. Now, it's not actually grilled. Traditionally, the shark is seasoned with local herbs and deep fried. And the bake is actually a flatbread that is also deep fried. But I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if you could take these two deep fried dishes and cook them on the grill? I've always believed that if something tastes good baked, fried, or sauteed, it probably tastes even better grilled. It brings us to the third secret of nonstick fish grilling. Choose a firm steak fish like swordfish, shark, or tuna. I'm using swordfish. So the first step in any Trinidadian recipe is to make what's called the paramen seasoning. Uh, it begins with chopped fresh scallion, shallot, garlic, celery, chopped fresh parsley and cilantro, chopped fresh mint, mm. thyme. We have chopped 
bell peppers and scotch bonnet chilies. And the scotch bonnet, sometimes known as the habanero, is the world's hottest chili, 50 times hotter than a jalapeno. Next, add fresh lime juice, about three quarters of a cup of water, salt and pepper to taste. Puree these ingredients in a blender. By the way, when you make any seasoning, always taste it to make sure it's got enough salt and pepper. Woo, that's pretty hot. So we'll pour the paramin seasoning over the swordfish or shark. And you want to turn each piece of fish to coat with seasoning on both sides. Marinate the fish for three to four hours. And you can see I've got it over a pan of ice to keep it cold. So while the fish is marinating, let me show you how to make the bakes. The bakes are a basic flatbread. You begin with yeast and sugar. To this mixture, add a tablespoon of warm water and stir to dissolve the yeast. Okay. I have here two and a half cups of flour and to this I'll add salt, baking powder, the yeast mixture, and enough water to obtain a thick but pliable dough. and process the ingredients until the dough comes together into a sort of smooth ball. Now, what you want to do is oil a large bowl, and then you can flour your fingers and pull the dough out of the processor. And form a smooth ball. And place it in the bowl Cover the bowl with plastic wrap and let the dough rise until doubled in bulk. That will take about an hour. Now, you may not see bread making supplies by the grill side at most American barbecues, but you know what? As you travel around the world's barbecue trail, grilled bread is a constant. Okay, we've got the bake. We've got the swordfish. The final component is the mango salsa. It starts with diced ripe mango, cucumber for crunch, red bell pepper for color, finely chopped scallion, and fiery scotch bonnet chili for flavor, a little brown sugar for sweetness, candy ginger for punch, rice vinegar, and chopped fresh mint. Simply toss these ingredients together Now this may seem a little complicated, but each part can be prepared well ahead of time. You can see the dough has risen till doubled in bulk, and I just divided it into four balls. Take a ball of dough and put it on your cutting board. You want to roll it out with a rolling pin. And actually, you'll see pit masters in India uh, doing this with naan right at the side of the grill. Okay, so now comes the moment of truth. We grill the bread. And we'll start by oiling the grill grate, as we always do. We're using these twin portable gas grills. And next, brush the top of each flatbread with oil. and arrange the flatbread oiled side down on the hot grate. And while the breads are grilling, brush the tops with oil.
So once the dough starts to bubble on top, just give each bake a turn and cook the other side the same way. Look how the dough blisters. And you can brush the bakes with a little more oil. Now let's grill the swordfish. So on goes the Paramin marinated swordfish. Okay, and the fish is ready for turning. Mmm, wow, look at that. You can really smell the aroma of the Scotch bonnet chili. And it'll just be another minute. Meanwhile, I'll take off the bakes. And that is some grilled bread. Okay, by now the swordfish should be cooked. And remember, we use that flake test. I press the fish and it breaks into clean flakes. Because the swordfish is so thin, it cooks really quickly. So here's the fish and here's the bait. Let me show you how to put it together. Take a flatbread and a piece of fish and a spoonful of the salsa, fish and bait because a fried fish sandwich never tasted so good. Mm. So there you have it. Fish on a plank, fish in a wrap, fish and bait fish that doesn't stick to the grill grate. See you next time. Mm. Fish is one of the most challenging foods to grill. And it's challenging because A, it either sticks to the grill grate, or B, it falls apart when you try and turn it. And listen, I have as much trouble with it as everybody else. I decided to dedicate this show to grilling fish, and in particular to three methods that solve those two problems, fish sticking to the grill grate and fish falling apart when you turn it. Portobello mushroom burgers, it's a burger so big in flavor you won't even miss the beef. Grilled pepper salad. This is a great recipe for people who have a tendency to burn their food. Vegetable paella. It's enough to make a carnivore green with envy. And smoke roasted apples. No meat, all flavor. The Vegetarian Grill. I'm Stephen Reichlin, and from the beautiful Tubac Golf Resort in Southern Arizona, it's time to grill. A vegetarian at a barbecue is like a thirsty man in the desert. But in some countries, like Japan and India, some of the most exciting food to come off the grill is meatless. Whether you're a full-time vegetarian or you just want to cut back on the meat sometimes, this show has you covered. Grilling in the embers, this is one of my favorite ways to cook. And it's certainly one of the most primal. In fact, the first barbecue uh, five or 600,000 years ago probably looked very much like this. The food was laid right on top of the embers. I first saw this procedure in Mexico where it was used to make salsa. Here, I used the technique to create a 
ember roasted pepper salad. Did you ever wonder what the first barbecue looked like? Probably something like this. It's the best way I know to make a roasted pepper salad, and you don't even need a grill grate. Start with sweet red, yellow, and green bell peppers, and lay them directly on the embers. This is a great recipe for people who have a tendency to burn their food. And roast the peppers until charred on all sides, about three to four minutes per side. Transfer them to a plate and let cool to room temperature. Then scrape the burnt skin off the pepper. See how easily it comes off? Charring the peppers and the embers this way looks cool, but it also caramelizes the natural plant sugars, making the peppers incredibly sweet and smoky. Once the skin is off, simply cut the pepper open, cut out the stem end, scrape out the seeds, and cut the peppers into strips. Then arrange the strips on the platter. It's as colorful as a Van Gogh. Now the dressing. Start with one clove minced garlic. Add salt, freshly ground black pepper, and sherry vinegar, or wine vinegar, and whisk until the salt crystals are dissolved. Then whisk in a few tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. Spoon the vinaigrette over the pepper salads. Finally, sprinkle each salad with currants for sweetness. Capers for tanginess. Pine nuts for crunch. Feta cheese for a burst of saltiness. And finely chopped flat leaf parsley. Never did burning your food look or taste so great. Let's see how we did. Mmm. When I was writing my first barbecue book, both my wife and my daughter went vegetarian on me. So uh, you'll notice in all of my books, I have a disproportionately large chapter on meatless grilled dishes. Uh, at the time, it was a matter of self-defense. But you know, it's a good thing because there are a lot of vegetarians and they deserve more than just hamburger buns and potato salad at a barbecue. The portobello is one of the meatiest of all mushrooms, which makes it a perfect candidate for a meatless burger. The portobello is a jumbo cousin of the button mushroom. Wipe it clean with a damp paper towel. You never want to soak porous mushrooms in water. Arrange the mushrooms in a baking dish. Next thing I want to show you is the onion. Cut crosswise into half inch slices. And here's a cool technique. If you skewer the onion crosswise, it won't fall apart on the grill. You're probably familiar with these, but in case you're not, poblano chili, think of it as a turbocharged green bell pepper. Let me show you the marinade. It starts with chipotle chilies, which are smoked jalapeno peppers. Next, add garlic. Chopped fresh onion. Balsamic vinegar. 
extra virgin olive oil, and a little salt and pepper. Puree the ingredients to a smooth paste. Pour the marinade over the portobello mushrooms. You can see I have the mushrooms gill side up. That's the side that will absorb most of the flavor. And using a spoon, just spread it into the gills. There is very little food or food culture left that is truly local. And one of those foods is barbecue. Barbecue is some of the last truly indigenous, truly local food there is. And it's been important for me to travel around the world documenting authentic barbecue in places as far flung as Indonesia, as Mexico, as Argentina. And to teach Americans not only how to prepare them here, but to appreciate them. I've set up the grill for direct grilling, and I'm using a three-zone fire. That means the first three burners are set on high for searing, two burners on medium for the more delicate foods, like grilling the hamburger buns, and one uh, zone completely off. That's my safety zones. And we'll continue by brushing the grill grate with a stiff wire brush and oiling the grate with either a cloth grill oiler or a folded paper towel, dipped in oil, and drawn across the bars of the grate. Okay, we're ready to grill. So just before you start grilling, brush the onion slices with melted butter. And season with salt and pepper. And while you're at it, brush the buns. I'm using ciabatta bread. The poblano chilies take the longest to cook, so they go on first. You can also put on the onions. The buns go on at the last minute. Now put on the mushrooms. And I like to start grilling the mushrooms gill side down. You'll see why in a second. And finally, toast the buns on the grill. And remember, the buns will grill in a matter almost of seconds. It's time to turn the onions. and turn the poblano chiles, and don't worry about burning the outside. You actually want to char and blister the skin. That will give the poblanos a terrific flavor. Turn the portobello mushrooms. And at this point, if you have any extra marinade, you can spread a little on top. OK, and the buns are toasted beautifully. You know, a lot of people forget to grill the buns, but for me, this is what makes a great burger. Then the portobellos, and you can actually see the juices sizzling. Then the poblano chilies. And finally, the onions. You see how the skewers kept the onion rings from falling apart. So here's how it goes together. Bun, chipotle marinated portobello, a slice of pepper jack cheese, then our fire roasted poblano chili, then a grilled onion, Remember to pull out the skewer. Then some sliced fresh avocado. And finally, the top bun. 
It's a burger so big in flavor, you won't even miss the beef. Mm. Most Americans, a paella, paella means rice with seafood, and chicken, and sausage. But in fact, in Spain, there are dozens, perhaps hundreds of different varieties of paella. So the notion of a meatless paella would not seem so strange. Paella belongs to a family of great rice dishes that includes jambalaya and risotto. But as far as I know, paella is the only rice dish that's traditionally cooked over a campfire. Here's a great showstopper for a meatless meal. Paella grilled over wood. I've fired up two kettle grills, but instead of charcoal, I've used oak logs. The first will be used for grilling my vegetables, the second for cooking the paella. Paella is simple to make. It only takes about a half an hour from start to finish, but you need to know about a few special ingredients. The first is saffron, the world's costliest spice, which comes from an aromatic crocus. The second is piquillo peppers. The third is pimenton, smoked paprika. And the fourth, of course, is the rice. The traditional Spanish rice is called a bomba. You can also use Italian arborio. The traditional pan is a paella pan, which you can find at uh, any Spanish market. Alternatively, you could use a cast iron skillet. Place the paella pan with a little olive oil on the grill and preheat the oil. People think of me as a cooking teacher. I've been called the barbecue guru or the gladiator of the grill. In fact, I see myself as a cultural anthropologist, and I see my job is taking, as taking my readers and my viewers around the world, discovering these incredible local traditional barbecue dishes all over Planet Barbecue. That is my mission. The next step is to make the sofrito, an aromatic mixture of onions, peppers, tomatoes, and garlic. So start by adding the onions, peppers, okay, stir these ingredients together. Next add the garlic and tomatoes. You add the garlic after a few minutes because it burns more quickly than the onions and peppers. Once the garlic has lost its rawness, add the tomatoes, saffron, and you see I soak the saffron in water to release its flavor, and smoked paprika. You might ask, well, what's the purpose of cooking something in a pan over a wood fire? Well, in fact, you can see the smoke curling up right up over the edge of the paella pan. That's going to add plenty of flavor to the paella. Once the sofrito is fragrant and beginning to brown, add the bomba rice. Cook the rice until the grains are shiny. Then add dry white wine and vegetable stock. Give the rice a stir and let it cook. Meanwhile, I'll show you how to grill the vegetables. The vegetables for the paella are limited only to your imagination. The short list might include zucchini, yellow squash, eggplant, onion, mini bell peppers, tomatoes, and garlic. Note for the onion slices, I pin them with toothpicks. That will keep them from falling apart on the grill. Note on the garlic, I have skewered the garlic cloves as well. That keeps the individual cloves from falling through the bars of the grate. I've set up the grill in a configuration called a three-zone fire. Uh, a lot of wood on one side, that's my hot zone. A few embers in the middle, that's my medium zone. And a cool or safety zone where I can move the vegetables if they start to burn. 
So let's see, the onions take the longest. We'll put those on first. Followed by the squash, zucchini, eggplant, mini bell peppers, garlic cloves, baby tomatoes, and baby onions. The precise recipe is much less important than what looks good and fresh. And for a little extra flavor while the vegetables are grilling, you can baste them with extra virgin olive oil and your favorite Mediterranean herb rub. Cooking time for the vegetables, about three to six minutes per side, just until each is golden brown. We live in uh, this incredible melting pot culture, and we have a gift we have a, a, a wonderful curiosity about the way people cook and eat in other countries. And we have this gift of bringing it and making it part of our own. So here are the grilled vegetables. Don't forget to remove all the skewers. You know, there is nothing like the high, dry heat of a grill to caramelize the plant sugars and bring out a vegetable's sweetness. OK, let's finish the paella. So you can see the vegetable stock has been absorbed mm. and the rice is tender. The next step is simply to add the chickpeas, piquillo peppers, all of our grilled vegetables. Stir in the vegetables. And don't forget the parsley. Is there anything more beautiful than grilled vegetables? Paella on a wood-burning grill. It's enough to make a carnivore green with envy. Smoke roasted, quote unquote, baked apples may seem newfangled, but in fact, they're as old as New England itself. Uh, back in colonial times, most homes did not have ovens. So the baking was done in what was called a Dutch oven, a large heavy cast iron pot with a metal lid with a depression in the center. And the pot would be set on the embers in the fireplace and additional coals or embers would be shoveled in top. That's really where the idea for this dish came. A baked apple may be delicious, but there's a way to make it better. You guessed it cook it in a smoker. The first step is to make a grilling ring. It's a piece of aluminum foil. Crumple it into a sort of donut, or you can use a commercial grilling ring. Hollow out the apple using a melon bowler. You want to remove the seeds and core, but not cut through the bottom so the apple will hold the filling. Add a spoonful of apricot jam, then a spoonful of cream cheese, then brown sugar, and finally a pat of butter. And what's going to happen as the apple smokes, the butter will melt into the sugar, the sugar will melt into the cream cheese, the cream cheese will melt into the apricot jam, and the whole shebang will melt into the apple. This is a water smoker. You can see I have a chimney's worth of lit charcoal in the bottom. Next, place the water pan in the center. 
And because I'm smoking apples today, instead of water, I'm going to place apple cider in the water pan. Next, you can put the lower rack over the water pan. And let's say if you were cooking 16 or 20 apples, you'd use both racks. And arrange the apples on the upper grate. Finally, place the dome lid on top of the smoker and adjust the vent holes so that they're wide open. To generate the wood smoke, take a couple of wood chunks. I'm using apple here to stay in the seam and add the wood chunks to the charcoal. Cooking time is one to one and a half hours. Let's check the apples. Check for doneness. Use the Charmin test. Squeeze the apples on the side. They should feel squeezably soft. These look absolutely luscious. Fire roasted pepper salad, vegetable paella, wood grilled portobello mushroom burgers, and smoke roasted apple. It's a vegetarian barbecue even a diehard carnivore will love. Mm. See you next time. Why has grilling become so popular? The tools have become much more sophisticated. Americans travel more than ever before, and we experience these incredible uh, grilled dishes. We want to come home and prepare these dishes at home. People want to entertain at home, uh, bring people to their backyards, and that's given rise to the outdoor kitchen, these amazing setups for grilling, certainly not uh, like the grilling setup when I was growing up.